Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Facilitation Friday and World Drum Club. I'm Kalani Dosh, your host and teacher, and I wanna share something with you that I've been working on. I actually just shot a video for our music therapy community. And uh, it's about this, this thing, which is kind of a geeky music pedagogy thing uh, that I co-developed with my colleague, Bill Matney. But I, I wanna relate it to facilitation and to drumming uh, for you all, because it's important. And we're not gonna cover everything here. This is called the Rhythmic Acuity Measurement Scale. And it's we created this as a way to help music therapists uh, develop their own rhythmic acuity. And what I mean by that is their ability to perceive of and to produce and to work with rhythms and timing and phrasing and music and create musical relationships with the people that you serve and with whom you play. And it doesn't matter if you consider yourself a facilitator or not, um, just as a musician, this is all important. So we're gonna cover some of these. There's about eight categories on this, so I might break it up into a couple different lessons. But this is why it's important. A lot of us, and myself included, and maybe you, you know, we go out and we go online or we go to classes, we go study with people, and we're sort of in this uh, rhythm, I think of it as like rhythm harvesting mode. Like we, we, we get some technique, but then it all becomes about learning this rhythm and learning this pattern and playing this rhythm. And we sort of go out into the marketplace. Uh, here on YouTube is one environment and we search out rhythms, right? And we learn different rhythms. We're sort of putting them in our little rhythm basket, you know, and we think that, Okay, if I learn enough rhythms, uh, then that's gonna somehow you know, elevate my playing. And uh, if you learn how to play rhythms precisely and you learn how to play them well and you can play them musically, that's, that's probably true. It would elevate your playing. But it's also very possible to learn a lot of rhythms and really not improve as a musician. You know, Just because you're learning a rhythm, if you're not executing it and you don't have fundamentals uh, it doesn't really matter. It's like somebody learning martial arts and they just don't have the technique and they're they're learning a lot of stuff that they're just not pulling off. And so it's, you know, what good is it? Right? You guys with me? So this scale is a way to look at the skills of a musician through the lens of a rhythmatist, uh, through the lens of music that's rhythmically oriented and finding the categories uh, of what is it, what's the makeup of a percussionist? You know, what are the skills? If you had to kind of separate them out, what are the categories? And why are they important? How do they relate to each other? So that's one of what we've done here. And I said this is kind of a, a music geeky sort of thing, but I want to talk about a few of them because it is important. Uh, so my, can, my goal for you and as, as a teacher, and I want to thank you for watching, you know, for spending your time at World Drum Club. I know you have a lot of choices. I sound like an airline, right? I, I know you have a lot of choices in your percussion travels. Uh, so I really appreciate you being here, but I do actually. But I also really care about your skills. And so I wanna help you guys. Um, and I've talked about how to develop rhythm in the past, but here's a few ways, here's a few things that you can be aware of and here's a few ways you can develop them. So the first thing is your own response being aware of your own response to music. And when people start playing, how do you relate to that? Are you kind of a passive participant? Do you just start playing alongside somebody else? And if they're playing their thing and you're playing your thing. Uh, if you're just playing something you know how to play, you know, you just kind of maybe go into autopilot. Uh, or do you have more of an interactive uh, way of playing? Are you, when you hear somebody play, do you play something that's complementary to that? Or do you play the same thing? Or do you want to play something different? What's the relationship that you're creating? Or is it uh, more purely interactive and deeper musically where you take on a leadership role a little bit? Do you try to change what the other person is playing? Do you let them take the lead? You know, what's, what's your relationship in, in terms of uh, your response? And it's important as a facilitator to understand what that response is. Some people kind of always want to be in control or to control the music, and they might take on a leadership role, even though that might not be the best thing in terms of facilitation. 
of somebody else's music. Or they take a back seat and the other person feels like they're always leading and they, they might want some guidance or leadership. So there's all sorts of different ways that we can relate to somebody else's music, just like in a conversation. Okay, but the first big music specific category is timing, of course. So, you know, timing is super important. I know it's something we're always working on and I'm always harping on you guys to use your metronome, whether it's an old school, you know, Dr. Beat DB88 like this one, or you're using your smartphone uh, for your metronome or to play along with. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I like practicing with a simple click And here's something you can try. So, play a pattern. And you're gonna make a recording of yourself. I want you guys to start recording yourselves more and listening back. Because the recording doesn't lie, right? And when you're playing, you might not be able to really tell if you're on the beat or not. But making a recording of yourself playing is a great way to, to know if you're aligning with the beat. And then if you're able to align with the beat fairly well at a medium tempo like this, 100, then what I want you to do is cut that in half and go with half the number of guide, let's call them you know street signs or guideposts, and you're the traveler. So you know if you can reduce the number of guides marks uh, that you're using, that's gonna place more responsibility on you, right? It's gonna give you more uh, of, of the musical, you're gonna have to carry more of the, of the rhythm forward. So you, that's another way to practice. So, so you're gonna cut your guide in half. And then when you do that, uh, you can start to vary your patterns. You know, and start to play around more and take more risks and push towards your edge, right? Push out towards your edges of comfort zone, get into that flow state where you are balancing your skills with the challenge of having to align with this very slow pulse. Now, to me, that's exciting, right? It might sound very simple, and it is simple, and the, some of the best ways to practice are very simple. So try that. Then, related to that, uh, another category is fortitude. And fortitude just means, if you think about the word uh, fortify or fortress or fort, it's how much strength do you have? How much impact or external attack <laughs> can you withstand from a musical perspective? Um, although some of you may have experienced playing music when people are hurling objects at you. Uh, I fortunately have not, but uh, I've heard it happens. All right, but musically speaking, that might sound like, you know, you playing a, a rhythm. And I, I think many of you can relate to this. You're playing a rhythm and one or two or three or 18 people are not playing uh, the same rhythm or they're not playing in the same time uh, in the sa to the same pulse. All right, so in that case, and there are some choices, of course, to make peace, you can always move to that person. And we do that as music therapists. I do that all the time. I'll adjust my tempo to fit my client. But what I'm talking about here is your ability to maintain your pulse even though uh, a lot of other things are happening. So here's a couple ways you can practice that. One, play a groove, and then just invite somebody else to play a groove that's really close, but not, not aligned with your, with your groove at all. So they're playing something else, you know. It's actually really hard to do. Uh, <laughs> to vocalize one thing and play another. And that's the other way you can practice, is to do what I just did, actually what I'm doing now, which is to play and then have a conversation. Or, you know, talk about something, uh, give instructions. And I often do this at my courses. I'll have people 
play, like once they, once they get some confidence and they've learned a rhythm, and then I say, okay, now play that, and two people play it and they start talking to each other and then see what happens. Now, it might surprise you. If you're an experienced musician, you can probably do that. But if you're, you know, beginner, intermediate, you might find that you have to stop playing when you start talking. And this is a matter of muscle memory and being musically comfortable and having sort of a lot of headroom, if you will. Or uh, you could look at it like operating well below your full capacity, right? Like a, when you drive a car around, you don't want to rev the engine up to 8,500 uh, RPMs all the time, or you're going to blow the engine out, right? So we don't often operate at full capacity. Uh, but when you're a beginner, you know, playing a rhythm might be your full capacity, and then you have nothing left. So you have no uh, spare, you know, brain power to do anything else. And from a facilitative perspective, that's not good, right? Because I've talked about uh, facilitating through the music, but if you're, you know, if all you can do is play, which is great, it's great to play, but if, if you, as soon as you start doing something else, the music falls apart, that's not good, okay? So that's fortitude. Uh, I'm gonna talk about one more and then probably do a part two to this. Uh, the other category, from the rhythmic acuity measurement scale that we're going to look at now is is related to fortitude and that is resiliency because resiliency is about getting back right resilience if something is if someone is resilient they bounce back right uh, or something is resilient it comes back into shape right after being bent or smashed uh, so how resilient are you as a musician all right. If you get off the beat or you make a little mistake, you you know, you, you're maybe you do talk to somebody and you kind of lose it a little bit. How quickly can you get back on there? So here's a way to practice that. We're going to make kind of a, you know, it, for, for lack of a real a real world example, I'm going to give you a way you can practice this uh, and you can cre recreate this scenario. And that is to create um, a beat with a pulse. And I'm going to use one hand so I can turn down the volume and then I'm going to turn this back and see how close I am and if I'm not real close I need to find my way back to the beat do that again Okay, success. So it's not about, you know, getting that perfect. It's just about, uh, and actually for the sake of this exercise, it'd be better if you weren't exactly in line with the pulse. Uh, of course, that is the goal ultimately, but for practicing resiliency, uh, you might want to actually have, have a recording of some music that kind of starts and stops at random times. And then you have to find, you know, listen to it and get quickly back on the beat and, and find where, um, you know, everything lines up so you can you can continue. All right, so I'm gonna stop this uh, lesson here, uh, but we'll do a part two to this where I complete, because there's a few more categories. Um, but I hope this all makes sense to you, and I hope that you will take these uh, categories. I wanna re review them really quickly. We talked about timing, we talked about fortitude, we talked about resiliency. And uh, these are all really important. We also talked about response, but these are the, the musical ones, timing, fortitude, and resiliency. These are key to your uh, skills as a musician and your skills as a facilitator of music uh, because you need to have extra space, extra function uh, in your abilities, not just to be able to play the music, but to be able to actually pay attention to what's going on and respond appropriately, right, as a facilitator. So this is big stuff, you guys. I know it's not the, uh, oh, I wanna go pick this rhythm and pick that rhythm and pick this rhythm kind of uh, lesson, but I think it's really important. Uh, I'd love to know what you think. Is this important to you? What do you do to develop some of these things? Please leave your suggestions below. We are here to help each other. Uh, this certainly isn't all about me, so actually to facilitate 
our all of our learning, I want to invite you to put your comments and ideas below. Of course, always be kind in your comments. And uh, thanks for tuning in to another Facilitation Fridays. I'm Kalani Das. This is World Drum Club. Thanks for watching.